All right, welcome everyone. I'm very excited today to introduce a topic that's near and dear to my heart, cat and mouse. This is really about defenders having better mouse traps. I'm Jason Maynard. I'm a field CTO for cybersecurity at Cisco Systems. This is what I do every day. I eat and breathe the defensive landscape and we're going to get into it today. All right, so what is it? What are we going to do? Well, we'll do a little bit of an introduction and then we'll get into an analysis perspective. And then we'll talk about endpoint detection response. We'll get into extended detection response, and then we'll conclude with some um, closing comments and then open the, the forum for questions. All right, EDR. Now, EDR is certainly a fantastic technology stack. And for many, you may still be using traditional endpoint protection and may not have elevated your game to, to take advantage of endpoint detection response capabilities. But we all know that defense, and prevention is a recipe for disaster, meaning you're never going to prevent 100% of everything. And this is really where detection and response technologies come in. Now, they're tremendously valuable, and I think that folks that haven't seen it before will certainly see that in this session. Now, a lot of questions come up when we start looking at things like endpoint detection and response, and when we're limited to that capability alone, we always want to wonder, why does reinfection reoccur? Where exactly did the compromise begin? What controls were bypassed or evaded? How is the adversary able to continue to wreak havoc in my environment? And does it tell the whole story? And I think what you'll find is it does a really good story of talking about what it does on the endpoint, but it doesn't go beyond that. So there's more to the story. And that's really where extended detection response comes in. This is really the mousetrap on steroids. This gives us a full perspective, and it may even include things like orchestration and automation so we can respond to events as they occur. Now, having the ability to go beyond the, the endpoint is critically important and truly understanding the full context of the threat. In order to really mitigate the threat, we need to understand the full context of that threat. Now, in this session, EDR is great, and I'm not knocking it. It's tremendously valuable. It's a much-needed tool. But at the same time, it's only as good as the asset that it's installed on. And so we've got to look for other areas to fill in those gaps. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to hopefully start leveling the playing field. And maybe, just for a moment, defenders will have the upper hand. Now, we'll talk about an analysis perspective. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Locard's exchange principle, but he's really the Sherlock Holmes of France. He was the pioneer of forensic science or forensics evidence within uh, the criminal space. And basically what he states is, is that an individual or a perpetrator can't enter or exit out of a crime scene without either leaving something behind or taking something from it. Now, this could be all kinds of things. Now, this could be a hair follicle falling out of your, well, in my case, beard into a fiber carpet. The challenge the investigator has is trying to figure out where that hair follicle is or a piece of blood that's not visible to the eye. These are all forensic details that are tremendously valuable in trying to determine what may have happened. Now, if you're interviewing somebody and they say they've never been there and you've got some forensic evidence that suggests otherwise, that doesn't mean maybe they've committed the crime, but it certainly means that they might be lying. Um, and uh, therefore, we may not need to open that onion a little further. And systems are very much the same way. Now, think about not Pietja. Now, I know this is an old one, but it's a good one. We know that in April 2017, it was leaked, part of uh, allegedly part of NSA tools. It was leaked by a group called Shadow Brokers, and it really took advantage of a vulnerability within Microsoft. But if you patched 100% of everything, you were immune to that particular attack because Microsoft released a patch a month earlier before these tools were stolen. Now, it leveraged Eternal Blue, so a, a, a weakness within the SMB stack. But what was interesting is, is once they took advantage of that vulnerability, they were able to elevate privilege by stealing credentials within the systems themselves and harvest um, and harvest those credentials using a Mimi Cats like toolkit. Now, um, when you look at it and you peel back the onion, ransomware was there, and this was obvious. It's a lot of noise, it's in your face, there's no hiding. You know something's happening. 
but there's all kinds of other noise that takes place that we may be missing. We know it was a supply chain attack. We know there's a vulnerability associated to it. We know there was credential harvesting and WMI and PS exec were leveraged. Lateral movement, command and control. We've got command line arguments that might have been passed. And we've got SMB remote code execution. So these are all of those forensic, these are the hair follicles or the fingerprint or the blood spatter. We've got to be able to figure out how can we pull all that information back in so we truly understand what the threat is up to and how we're going to go about mitigating it. So what I want you to think about is this. As we move along here, I want you to think about not Pietja 2. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not suggesting not Pietja 2 is coming. But what I am suggesting is, is let's think about if that was to happen, how would you go about understanding that threat within your environment? There's two questions typical, typically asked within organizations when a threat occurs. And that is, do we have protection mechanisms in place to defend against the threat in, in, in question? And the other is, have we been targeted? So have we been compromised or popped um, with this particular threat or campaign? So think about those two questions and how you might go about doing that within your organization as I go along within this session. Now the time, it begins, right? Something happened. In this case, it's not that big, but it's interesting nonetheless. But before we get into it, let's just recap what endpoint detection response is. So endpoint protection, this is tr traditional AV, right? There might be some other capabilities like blocking of USB ports and um, you know, other components of protection on the endpoint, but that's the traditional protection capability that we've leveraged for many years on the endpoint. And then there was this evolution of endpoint detection and response, knowing we can't prevent 100% of everything. And so EDR came into play and it was really complementary to endpoint protection platforms. It wasn't a displacement, at least not at the time. And then over time, customers and, and users of the technology certainly have pushed the boundary and said, look, at why do I have two different technology stacks to serve a purpose? And then we've started seeing this come together. EDR vendors started adding some endpoint protection capabilities, and then endpoint protection vendors started adding endpoint detection and response capabilities. And so there's a couple of things that you want to see within an endpoint detection response platform. You want the EPP or endpoint protection capabilities. So things like behavioral analytics, machine learning, right? Algorithms to know what clean and bad looks like and making sense of it all. You've got signature-based detection. You want to look at the overall attack surface and integration where possible. And you want to posture and profile and understand the assets to make sure that you're giving the access required to the environment to reduce risk. And then we get into detection, right? Because you're not going to prevent 100% of everything. I know I keep saying it, but it's a reality. We want continuous activity monitor monitoring. We want to make sure that we're checking to see what's happening. If a file is doing something that's strange, we want to maybe flag that and mitigate. We want to be able to do searching across the fleet of assets for things that are interesting. This could be something like Log4j and some of the um, software that's out there in the environment and whether or not we're exposed. We get things like sandboxing and detonating that payload within a um, sandbox environment and looking at all the behaviors. We get into cloud-based IOCs. And then threat hunting, right? And that's what we're going to do a little bit here as we expand based on the initial incident that we see. And then obviously MITRE attack frameworks, critically important. I really believe that these lower level um, observations that we pick up like SHAs and um, uh, domains and IPs and URLs, you know, they're, they're, they're good things to block because we know about them and it gets rid of some of the noise, but we want to elevate our defenses up to the tactic and technique um, and sub-technique level and really make it difficult and costly for the adversary to be successful. We get into vulnerabilities of the applications, low prevalence of, of software identification. So this is just identifying software that has not been seen and, and detonating that in the payload looking for unmanaged endpoints and obviously extend our capability with XDR would be an ultimate goal here. Now for response, we want things like custom block and allow lists. We want application control, endpoint isolation, 
And obviously we want to integrate this. We, we hear and, and everyone talks about platform or driving towards platform. Well, it's critically, critically important to do so uh, because having all of these technology stacks siloed is very difficult and hasn't produced the success that the industry had hoped for at one point in time. So let's get into the investigation itself. Now we're really focused on the endpoint. We're not going above that at this point in time. And so what we have here is we have uh, an incident that took place and this individual had noticed the command prompt jump up on their screen. Now, again, think about what you might be doing in your environment to achieve the outcome of understanding of what's going on and then and building out your mitigating controls. But in this case, we have an individual that has reported this. Now, we all know that this is probably very few and far between, right? This individual is part of HR, happened to see, see the command, crop, pr command prompt, and then they did a screen capture and send it to the help desk. And so it begins, right? So it comes into the help desk, they see the screenshot, and fair play to the individual, in this case, John Doe, because I'm very creative, um, by submitting the ticket, because we know what happens with most, right? They would have closed the box and moved on throughout their day. So fair play to the individual reporting this particular event. Now, what are we going to do here? So we've got a file, a screenshot, resume.exe. Now you might jump into your AV platform and start looking there. Um, maybe you have other insight, but we, we don't have a whole lot here to start from. And so if you do have endpoint detection response, this could be an opportunity, and this is where we're going to start. But what we know so far is John Doe opened the ticket. We know it's a Windows 10, uh, and this is only because it's a corporate asset, and we've got an asset tag. We've got a file name of resume.exe, and then we've got um, uh, the comment from the user saying, I don't know how it got here, right? But it just appeared. So what do you think we need to do now? Well, I'm not asking you to answer at this point in time, but the one thing that we want to do is maybe look up resume.exe within their endpoint detection response platform. Now, this should tie to a SHA. So this is something new that we didn't have, and this can allow us to expand our investigations beyond the file name itself. And we've got this timeline, and in this timeline, we start looking at it, and we see what we call as a retrospective event. And so what this means is, is that um, the uh, technology stack is currently in an audit mode, uh, as an example, because if not, it would have blocked it. Um, and so retrospective just says we've got some intelligence to suggest that something has happened within the environment and we're letting you know. And so it goes back in time. It never loses sight of what happened previously and gives you insight that an event has occurred and you might, might want to pay attention to it. So what we can see here is that we know that PowerShell, by looking at our endpoint detection response platform, created the resume.exe. And if we scroll back in the timeline and we look at PowerShell, we can now see that command line argument. Remember, I said this is tremendously valuable because now we've got some new information. We know that PowerShell went and used the web client to download a file from ret.space using port 8080. Um, they pulled down the payload resume.exe and they started that resume.exe process. Pretty neat. In a lot of environments, you wouldn't even know that. You just know whether the file was good or bad um, and, and, and maybe have a little bit of information about it and that's it, if there was any information available. So I think we're, we're starting off pretty good. And here's where we get telemetry feeding in. We call it a cloud-based IOC and we can see that it's talking about PowerShell and WinWord and macros and nefarious activities such as downloading and executing malicious executables. So it's giving us an additional alert that something interesting uh, is happening here, but we already know a couple more things that we didn't know previously, and we'll summarize in a second. Now, we scroll back in the timeline, we can see the relationship with WinWord and PowerShell, and that aligns to the IOC that we've got triggered here. But what is the additional information we have? Well, we now have that SHA-256. We know PowerShell was involved in the creation of resume.exe, and it connected to ret.space. So it made an outbound connection to the internet. Cloud-based IOC also indicates macro. So we have some insight into the relationship between Word, macro, PowerShell, and this bad file. We already know in our hearts something's not good here. So what's next? Is that, is that great information or what? Well, that's not enough. And if you stopped here and just blocked or re-imaged the asset, 
you're going to have reinfection occur. So we need to go back in this timeline. We need to know how did Windward get involved here? And so as we do, we find that explore.exe is responsible. And again, we have these command line arguments which are critically, which are critically important. Now we've got, it calls out specifically winword.exe and it's John Doe desktop resume doc M. Ah, and it's opening up the file. So obviously the user clicked resume doc M, which is a macro enabled document. Winword launched because they tried to double click the document. The, maybe the enabled macros warning came up, but the user clicked enable. Then the macro was invoked. PowerShell got started, went to ret.space, pulled down resume.exe, and started that process. Wow, right? That's a lot of great information. WinWord, PowerShell, macro, explore, launched WinWord, right, to open the document. So, you know, many people might say, listen, I can't even do that in today's world. That is great information, but it's not enough, right? We got to keep going. And so what we need to understand is where's resume doc M in all of this. And so we can see that and we see the relationship of the application that was the, the problem child in all of this. Now we see it's outlook.exe. Now for the endpoint, that's it. Like that's all I can do on the endpoint detection response side of things. I can expand my investigation further and we're going to do that because we don't have all the answers we need, but we do have some good insight. We know John Doe used Outlook that um, if you double click resume doc M, WinWord was launched, macro was enabled, PowerShell was used to go to ret.space and download and start resume.exe pretty neat. So great insight on the endpoint, but let's expand this. What if we looked and investigated because we have sandboxing technology and we wanted to look a little bit more about what might be happening by detonating this file in a sandbox environment. Now this could already be within the sandbox based on the telemetry that you feed into it. Um, or you may manually upload that file and execute it in the, in the sandbox environment. And so, you know, you've got VMs that are going to execute, you've got recent threat scores, total convictions, submission status, and then source by status as well. But the important piece here is really, let's do the analysis of this. And you'll leverage whatever sandboxing you have in your arsenal. Now, the one thing really neat here is, is that I can see right away that, that any internal target that might be exposed within my environment that has an endpoint detection response capability enabled, will actually be highlighted here. So if I'm investigating this just based on a blog, I would know immediately whether or not I, I have uh, indications of compromise within the environment. But that aligns to what we see with the ticket. We see the threat score of 100. We've got details of the submission. And then we've got MITRE ATT&CK uh, framework alignment. So we've got the tactic that's being called out based on the behavioral indicator being used. And we can also drill into the behavioral indicators. So this might be a little bit hard to see, but bottom line is it talks about the, you know, it's a remote access a Trojan. There's keylogger capabilities. It uses encryption to communicate on the, uh, on the network. So again, a lot of, and there's a mutex uh, actually, and, and it's related to poison ivy, but a lot of forensic data that now we can use in our investigation. Stuff that we didn't know previously. As we drill into the analysis, we get HTTP traffic. And again, depending on the technology stack you're using, you may or may not be able to take action right from the platform itself. In this case, you can. And so if you wanted to block or do additional investigation or spin into other technology stacks, um, regardless of the vendor, you can certainly do that. We can see ret.space here. And we can see some intelligence coming in from a technology stack that also suggests that this is a high risk domain. So now we know that re resume.exe, even if we didn't know it was bad, um, the relationship with this domain certainly suggests uh, that it's bad. Um, we also know the action that might have been taken using that, that third party in, or, or integrated um, security technology capability, and it would have been blocked here. 
Now, extracted domains, processes, again, all the information you need to do deep, rich analysis of that particular file and all of its behaviors, not just what was seen based on the uh, event the user submitted. Now, again, we can take action at any point in time. We see the registry keys, the created keys, the deleted keys or modified keys. And we can also pivot into a video. Now, again, depending on the technology stack that you're using, and here we can replay the video of that file being detonated, whether through automation or manual, um, and have the ability to um, see what the end user had um, noticed during the event itself. And in this case, this is exactly what the user screen scraped and sent into the help desk. But there could be additional information here. Now we've got file activity as well that's completely tracked. And then we look at MITRE ATT&CK uh, alignment, which now starts aligning any of the uh, indicators to MITRE ATT&CK. And again, full context into what that is and the ability to pivot into uh, MITRE and um, at, you know, dig a little bit deeper into these tactics and, and, and techniques and sub-techniques that you may not be fully intimate with. Um, and so again, providing you more information of what might be happening. So we know that there's some TTPs being used here around persistence and privilege escalation. They're using the registry keys and startup folders in order to do that on a Windows-based system. Now from here, we could query this across the fleet of assets. Again, depending on the integrations and third-party technologies that you might have, this may or may not be possible in a technology stack that you're using. You may just need to pivot into another platform uh, to drive that outcome. But nonetheless, you can still drive that outcome. It might be another step or two. Not a big deal. So here we are, again, a summary of Poison IV default mutex. It talks a little bit about it. Again, we've already went through it. But the really key thing here is able to now take that mutex and scour our entire fleet of assets very, very quickly. And if you could do that, you'll get some success here because now I can find out whether or not the fleet of assets, any come back with any residual of that mutex. So maybe resume.exe is long gone and there's no evidence of that. We still capture that data. And again, we can take automated actions within the endpoint detection response platform because there's a response component and hopefully you're going to capture forensic scans based on the severity of the alert. And this is going to capture all the details that you would expect from a forensic scan, right? Interfaces, names associated, map drives, SHA-256s. But the one thing that I think is really interesting here is, is that the disposition has been flagged automatically within the platform. So green obviously means the disposition is clean. Uh, gray will be unknown. And then red would be malicious. So again, a good way of visualizing something that you may not have known right away maybe part of this particular campaign or event, maybe a completely different uh, um, attack itself. Now we get into isolation of the computer. So having the ability to very quickly automate the isolation of the asset, no matter where it stands in the, in, in the environment, because we've got hybrid work, people are working from coffee shops. If there's a threat, you probably want to be able to isolate that asset, even though it's not on premise. So you can drive that through automation or through an EDR technology as well. You could take that forensic snapshot manually, uh, it, even if you uh, didn't do it through an automated process. And then we want to make sure that um, we have the ability to, to submit into a, a sandbox environment based on severity as well. And, and, and so you have that ability to, to maybe submit files that are questionable or that has triggered an, a, a certain severity level and then have them detonate in the sandbox environment so we can capture a little bit more detail in the behavioral indicators that may be associated to that, that particular file. All right, we're moving on here. We're coming up near the end of endpoint detection response. And so the other thing that you could do too is automate the ability to move into more restrictive based a policy. So you may have a production-based policy that has multiple engines running, uh, but not all of them because maybe there's certain sensitivities or risks to the uh, production environment that you decided not to enable these. Um, in an event, if there was uh, a high severity or medium severity, you could then move them automatically into a new policy and push out those additional engines so you can grab additional details and, and, and potentially mitigate that threat. So what we know now is we've got Outlook, Resume, Doc, 
am WinWord macro PowerShell ret space and resume.exe. Pretty cool. But we've got a ton of new data, right? We've got all the behavioral indicators from mutexes to remote command shell to keylogger. We know uh, antivirus sees this as malicious. We've got persistence in the registry. We've got our TTPs with the run keys in the registry for Windows and the startup folder, as well as privilege escalations taking advantage of both the same uh, technique here as well. And then we've got network streams, processes, artifacts, registry, and file activity, and scripts. We know it's macros, and we know it's PowerShell. And the application sources, Outlook.exe. But we don't know any more than that. And that's the problem. How did it get into Outlook.exe? Now, I'm sure everyone's saying, oh, that's obvious, an email. Well, what email, right? Is there more to the story? And that's where extended detection and response comes in. So we've got things like malware, IPS, security intelligence feeds, flow alarms, files, email, DNS, web, sandboxing, IP address, tactics, techniques, third-party threat intelligence. We've got endpoints, forensics, and it goes on, right? Systemic response, orchestration, automation. These are all things that we're going to pull in. And network detection response is an element of this. 45 minutes just won't allow us to add that bit to the session. And we want it, this ultimately to be actionable. And this is where we start taking all of that technology now and using it as needed to drive an extended detection response capability. And this is where we now start pulling the entire piece of the puzzle together. So we've got good insight for endpoint detection response. That's great. It's valuable. You need it, right? No way around it. But if we search resume.exe, what we end up finding is, is that we've got a file name, resume.exe, we knew about. That green file there is actually PowerShell, and that's showing the relationship there. And we've got that one endpoint. So visually, we can see this, right? We've got this relational graph of, of observations within the environment, and now stitching them and tying them together so we get better context. Now, those dots are allowed, uh, again, uh, us to take actionable um, it allows us to take action on an element uh, based on the technology stacks that we may have integrated within the XDR platform. Then we look at detailed, uh, sorry, we look at ret.space, the domain itself, right? Resume.exe is great. And so we do see that and we see the relationship with PowerShell, which we know because the macro kicked off PowerShell that went to ret.space. But look at this. We see two more endpoints. These are two independent endpoints. Now you might be saying, well, wait a minute, why didn't we see those earlier? Well, because maybe it's not resume.exe. Maybe it's a different SHA-256. We don't know, maybe the adversary is flipping out that, that uh, malicious payload. Maybe it's a different email that brought them in. We don't know, we'd have to investigate further, but it's interesting that those assets went to ret.space and obviously we've got to add those, those to the investigation here. And then when we look at resume.docm, we see the relationship that we already know about Outlook, Resume Doc, M. We know it's tied to that endpoint. But look, it's not tied to those two other endpoints up top. But as we continue to look, we got two message IDs. We see another person. We see John Doe and Jason at victim.com. You can see how creative I am. We see an IP address of the sender. We see an email subject line. We see a domain that's actually in the body of the email, too. That's actually suspicious. We didn't even know about that one. And then we've got a URL that's unknown and an IP within our infrastructure that has reached out to that URL as well. So not only is it in the message of those two emails, but we have an asset that reached out to that particular uh, URL. And it's gray because it's unknown. We don't know if it's good or bad at this point in time. And we see the email sender. Now, again, my creativity is coming out with muhaha at bad.com. I know it's sad, but anyways, um, that's the sender. And so now we can um, uh, do all kinds of things because we've got some new information. We can add some new blocking capabilities, right? Let's block muhaha at bad.com from sending email to us. Let's look and investigate those additional domains. We got to go to those endpoints and do some more work. Again, we can take action. I mentioned that earlier. But now we can truly remediate the threat and stop reinfection, right? This provides more of a holistic view 
and it empowers the team with higher fidelity data, right? And again, the bottom line is, is that they can action against it. So how does this tie into the stream that we already knew with endpoint detection and respond? Well, muhaha at bad.com said to both John and Jason, Jason didn't click it, maybe he didn't read the email, maybe it deleted it, maybe he just hasn't had time yet. John, on the other hand, we know executed the payload uh, or open the email, executed resume doc M, uh, and then that chain of events with macros and PowerShell, ret.space and resume.exe started uh, and bad happened. So more to the story, right? We have got two more targets or endpoints. We have two targeted internal email addresses, and now we have additional emails, domains, URLs, and IPs that we're going to have to investigate. Again, we can only show so much in the time allotted today. But we've also answered those two questions. Remember at the very beginning, I said, whether or not we've been compromised, well, we know we have. And we know a little bit even more beyond resume.exe. And we know that we have defensive capabilities in play. Why do we know that? Well, we, knew, we know that because we started seeing some of those things show up as red and orange, right? So it knew that these were suspected uh, domains. Um, uh, it, or they were malicious uh, domains or files. And therefore, if I had capabilities and they were enabled, we could mitigate against that threat. So again, it's more to the story. And hopefully now we've completed the puzzle. Now, I've got a quick example of a threat hunt. All right, we're gonna get into a threat hunt example here. Real live demo or recorded demo. Uh, and then we're gonna come back to conclude and then uh, ask for questions. Cisco SecureX, threat hunting example using third-party integration, Palo Alto's autofocus capability. So we're going to import this snapshot that includes the module. This is fed in through Palo Alto or the intelligence is supported by Palo Alto's autofocus capability. You can see this here. It's marked as malicious. We can pivot right into the uh, tool for Palo Alto. But what we want to do is look at this from an extended detection response perspective. Verdicts, sightings, indicators, threat context. We're going to look at all of that, but we want to look at it from the perspective of our entire environment. That URL alone, is there more to the story here? And that's what we want to find out. So can we make other tools better? I think we can. So let's go through this. So from here, we can do the things that we normally do. We're gonna unblock or block this domain. I blocked it previously, that's why it's showing as uh, blocked and then unblocked, but we're gonna make sure that we're gonna block it here. We can also jump into secure malware analytics for sandboxing, whether we wanna browse or search or actually send the URL to the sandbox to be detonated. We're gonna do that here. So there's uh, Cisco malware analytics platform, formerly ThreatGrid, you can see there's one uh, submission happening right here, but we're going to do this right from SecureX. We're going to go in, we're going to submit the URL to ThreatGrid. We'll go ahead and click that. We can see success here, but success, let's see if that really is. So we'll refresh this and look at that. There it is. It's already being submitted. So we didn't have to drag and push this into another, you know, product or we were able to drive an outcome right from SecureX. Now, while that's happening, we're gonna go ahead and create a new case. And that case is what we're gonna work on here. So we've got the ribbon at the bottom. There's the actual URL that we've entered. We can actually do things um, like, maybe we'll just grab the domain here and we can go up to enrich and do a quick search. Um, we've got uh, one observation, so you can screen scrape something and put it in there. We're gonna add it to this case. And now we've got a domain and we've got that URL. And from here, what we could do is investigate it in threat response. Give it a name. We'll come back to that a little bit later. We can add some notes. We're going to do that as well. But let's go ahead and investigate that. And look at that. We have that URL. And we also have an asset that was talking to the domain itself. Now, from here, we have the ability to do some things as well, including take a forensic snapshot, maybe isolate the host. All of these are options with SecureX orchestration. These are workflows that are built. We're going to come back and actually do that. 
um, in a little bit. Let's go back to the malware analytics platform, so the sandbox, and let's have a look at our, our submission. And you can see it's still running here. And the nice thing about this, this is called Glovebox, and I have the ability to come in here and interact with it. Sometimes malware, you may need to do something. There's a lot of automation in the platform, but at times you might need somebody to come in and, and invoke a certain behavior, um, do something, and uh, maybe something bad will happen. And then obviously everything's getting recorded. We're gonna look at all the details in a minute. So you can see here, I just uh, you know went to that domain directly and this is gonna finish up here in a second and then we're gonna go ahead and jump into the report. Now there's not a whole lot here with this particular URL that we submitted, but there's some interesting data points regardless. So you see behavioral indicators, you can see HTTP traffic, and you can see that little drop down arrow as well. Like at any point in time, if there is that that exists, like you can see that here, I can actually take action right from here. Now I'm in the malware analytics platform, so I pivoted from SecureX, but I still have the ability to take action in this portal. I continue to scroll down, extract the domains, processes, we've got artifacts, everything that happened is recorded, right? Registry entry, uh, so activities around, uh, you know, created keys, modified keys, deleted keys, and then you get all the file activities associated to it. One thing that's really cool is, is that we can come in here and look at the, uh, anything that's uh, aligns to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So here we can see, you know, a tactic called defense or defense evasions. It's obfuscated files or information. Try to say that 10 times. Um, and I can pivot right into MITRE, learn a little bit about it. Um, again, not a whole lot happening here. All right, so that's the report. Great. Let's go ahead and maybe we can update some notes here of what we found so far. So we'll go ahead and put in our timeline. Apollo sees a threat and investigated it in autofocus. Um, then we ran the URL in threat grid. Um, and the score report came back as 48. And maybe uh, what we want to do is grab the actual link to that and let's enter it back into um, our um, notes section of this um, case book. And then the domain is not accessible. We saw it didn't actually resolve. Um, and maybe that's a, a good indication of why it scored fairly low um, in um, threat grid or malware or secure malware analytics platform. So I'm just gonna give this a name, Palo uh, Autofocus. That's where the source started from. Now, what we could do here is we can come in and we could actually take a forensic snapshot. And there we go, we've started that, but let's go ahead and jump to Orbital. Again, this is some additional integration and we can see that snapshot actually taking place right now. Now this will take a few minutes to actually run the snapshot. We're gonna go through the snapshot together here. There's a ton of data, so bear with me. There's SHA-256s, the hash is running, but look at here I can also take action. The green means good, right? Gray means unknown, and then red would mean bad. So I can see that right here in the interface. I get into shared resources, application shims, log on sessions, I've got logged in users. I've got uh, recent file data. And again, you can see it's rendering and it's providing us insight into whether or not these are uh, potentially malicious. Now look at this, all the PowerShell history is here as well. Now you might be wondering, okay, wait a minute, how did you do the forensic snapshot? What did that have to do with maybe Palo Alto's autofocus? Well, it had nothing to do with it. Um, they fed us the data. We've used the data to scour the infrastructure and we've made a determination that we wanted to take a forensic snapshot against an endpoint that has Cisco Secure Endpoint on it. And that's how we have dro drove uh, this particular outcome. But again, forensically this become, in an investigation, forensically this becomes uh, you know critical data that you wanna get, whether you're on-prem or off-prem, this is some data that you certainly want to capture. Now, you might want to also have isolated the host, and we could have done that as well. In this case, all I did was take a forensic snapshot. 
you've got user groups, you've got Windows Open Shares, you know, loaded modules and the hashes assigned to them. And it goes on and on and on, scheduled tasks. And then finally we're coming towards the end with temp directory file data. What did you think of that demo? Interesting, right? We start with some telemetry feed, we get some insight, we expand our investigation, and we come to a conclusion. Pretty neat stuff, but that's XDR in action. All right, so we know that endpoint protection and endpoint detection and response is critically important, and you can do it with single platform. Endpoint detection and response is only as good as the asset. So if you have IoT-based devices or you have a healthcare system that has uh, a warranty that says thou shall not install endpoint detection or endpoint prevention on that platform, you're going to need other technologies in your arsenal to be able to detect and prevent threats in the environment and respond. Sandboxing provides tremendous telemetry, right? We got into those behavioral indicators. We elevated our understanding up to the tactic and technique level. We have the ability to automate things like forensic scan, isolation, malware analytics. And then there's more to the story, right? We, ultimately, what we want to do is remediate and remove reinfection, but we need that holistic view to do that. And that's where extended detection response capabilities come in. XDR provides tremendous insight across the fleet of technologies. This should be not only vendors that you may have got your XDR platform from, but any vendor that you may invest in. We want to make sure that this is supporting third-party technologies. The ultimate goal here is to empower the analyst and then obviously drive automation. Let's stop with the the, the repetitive tasks that individuals are doing, and let's use our teams um, to drive effective change within the organization and not have to do some of the manual activities. So automation and orchestration will be key. There's threat hunting services that can help augment your team. Um, and you, you know there's a large drive towards managed endpoint detection or response services. So those are some of the capabilities. If you're going to market, you can start looking at, you know, what is EDR? How do I drive towards an XDR platform? How, how can I augment my team with threat hunting services? And hey, I may even want some management capabilities to help support me overall. All right, thanks everyone. Hopefully you got some insight into endpoint detection and response and the capabilities it brings and some of the limitations. It can't be installed everywhere, as well as the power of XDR, extended detection response, and truly understanding how the adversary might go about wreaking havoc within our environments. Defenders, we got this.